hello. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Salmon Matter. This is a co-production of the Pacific Salmon Foundation and Conversations That Matter, filmed here at the Oh Boy Studios in Vancouver. Today we're going to be talking about salmon health uh, with one of my colleagues from the Pacific Salmon Foundation, Dr. Andrew Bateman. Eight years ago, the Pacific Salmon Foundation embarked on a partnership with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and Genome BC to better understand how infectious agents were affecting the health of wild Pacific salmon. Uh, naturally, this touched on the contentious topic of salmon farming, and of course, most salmon farming here in British Columbia is farming of Atlantic salmon in open net pens in our coastal waters, uh, and the disease risk that might be posed to wild Pacific salmon from those farming operations. There was general suspicion that open net pen aquaculture operations were contributing to Pacific salmon declines, but the issue lacked scientific clarity. Now, research from that partnership that I mentioned between PSF, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Genome BC, has confirmed that open net pen salmon farms do indeed pose a risk uh, due to the transfer of parasites and other disease-causing pathogens between wild and farmed salmon. The findings prompted PSF to make a clear position that we believe that open net pen salmon farming in our waters need to do transition away from operating in the water where wild salmon and hatchery stocks of Pacific salmon could be impacted from a health perspective. Now, since then, our, foundings have, our findings have informed decisions to phase out open net pen operations in the Discovery Islands and the Broughton Archipelago, both the major migration routes for Pacific salmon. And in 2020, the federal government announced their commitment to transition away from open net pen facilities by 2025, a commitment that was again reflected uh, recently in the federal budget that was announced. So joining me today is my colleague from the Pacific Salmon Foundation, Dr. Andrew Bateman, who is the Salmon Health Manager for our PSF Marine Science Program. Andrew, welcome to Salmon Matter. Thanks, Mike. Hi, nice to be here today. Well, it's good to see you. And I hope to actually see you in person sometime soon after we're through, through sure. COVID. I know you've been busy. You also have a new baby there in, 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 the, in the house, as well as your uh, busy research agenda. Why don't you start things off by telling us a little bit about yourself personally, your, your background, education, you know, what brought you to the kind of work that you're doing uh, with us at the Pacific Salmon Foundation? Sure. Well, I, I grew up in Victoria, actually, and I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Victoria, where I focused on math and biology. So I'm, I'm sort of a mathematical biologist. Uh, after my, my time in Victoria, I went and did a PhD actually in the UK, and that was studying meerkats. So long way from salmon. They live in the deserts of South Africa in the Kalahari. Uh, but the whole time I was in, I was in England doing my PhD, I kind of couldn't wait to get back to the trees and ocean and, and salmon. So for the last the last decade, really, since I, I finished my PhD, I've been working largely on, on salmon and other marine species, dabbled in killer whales. Uh, and, and that brought me, brought me to PSF. And so I've been working with PSF for coming on three years now. Okay, great. And we're delighted to have you. Uh, you've been a part of this research, as you said, for a few years, working very closely with Dr. Christy Miller Saunders at the uh, uh, DFO or Fisheries and Oceans Canada laboratories there in, in Nanaimo. Why don't we start at, at the very basic level of uh, the definition of what does it mean when we talk about salmon health um, and, and, and how does it play into, how does this research that you're doing around salmon health play into the overall uh, context for how our Pacific salmon are, are doing? And I, I realize that anytime you ask how are our Pacific salmon doing, a scientist, this is a very difficult thing because it's a very complex uh, web, uh, very difficult to be generic, but uh, do the best you can. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, how are salmon doing is, is a complicated question. Uh, many populations are not doing well, as, as many of us know. The same is true of, of, of salmon health, really. It's, it's a bit of a complex question. Some people would define 
health in general as, as being free of illness or injury. But that, that's pretty narrow definition. And really, the idea of health needs to touch on you know, multiple aspects of, a, of an individual's life, whether that's a salmon or whether that's a person or, or any other animal. And so really, it, it, draw, it needs to bring into to consideration you know, the environment in which we or in which salmon live, um, the challenges we face day to day, as well as infectious agents and, and possible injury, predation, that kind of thing. Not, not for humans, we're not getting predated. Uh, but so really, we're, we're trying to see what role health of, it, of the individuals and the populations play in the salmon declines that you know, make, make the media from day to day. And, and for the, the strict salmon health initiative in particular, we were really focused on, on infectious agents, so bacteria, viruses, and, and whether they might be causing disease, a, a state of ill health uh, in, in salmon. Because there, there are viruses that even as people, we can, we can have a cold and we might not say we're diseased. You know, a bit of a, a stuffy nose uh, isn't, isn't necessarily a big deal. And, and some infectious agents might not cause any, any detriment to, to a few salmon. So it's, it, the question of infection and disease is, is, is a bit nuanced sometimes. So we want to see, are those infectious agents playing a role in salmon declines? Obviously, as you mentioned in, in your introduction, there, there's a potential role that salmon farming operations are playing. Salmon farms are a, a large aggregation of salmon that aren't naturally in our coastal waters. And, and so they present an opportunity for the, the farm salmon to pick up disease, whether that's naturally occurring in the background of the marine environment anyway. Uh, but but they may the, the real issue is that they may amplify that disease. It may spread on the farms, become amplified above background levels, natural levels, and then transfer to, to wild salmon. And that may then cause a problem for wild salmon. Within the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, we actually went further than just a focus on disease. And, and we'll get to that when we probably talk about some of the technology that's been developed within the program. But we tried to look, scratch the surface more than that, get deeper into uh, some, some elements of other challenges that salmon face, and that may be high water temperatures or low oxygen conditions, things like that. Those, those all feature into, into the idea of, of salmon health because it's this multifaceted idea. You know, you may be infected with disease one day, or sorry, not disease. You may be infected with an infectious agent one day and not suffer disease. But another day, if, if the water's too hot or you've just gone through a very stressful life event, like a, a large scale migration up or down our coast, then that same infectious agent may pose a problem in that different scenario. Oh, it's, it's fascinating stuff and you describe it so clearly, Andrew. And I guess this is, um, you have to be careful about comparisons with human health, of course, but I feel like our uh, literacy around understanding even what is a pathogen versus what is disease uh, has grown immensely because of the coronavirus and the COVID uh, situation that, that we're, we're facing. And I guess, and you can correct me, I'm the history major here, <laughs> correct me on this, but you know, uh, we know that uh, there's this notion of a cumulative or compounding effects that, that happen in ecosystems in the environmental context you know, in other words, it's not any one thing that may necessarily be, be causing these declines in salmon. Um, uh, but certainly, if we can hone in on understanding the various factors and certainly figure out the ones that humans can control in a more positive, uh, proactive way, this is, is, is kind of where you're leading with this research in, in an applied way, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Eventually, the goal is to take what we've found through this this program, ongoing program within PSF, and be able to apply it as you say. So, you know, like I mentioned, there are these multiple factors that might be influencing salmon, and and absolutely, they they might compound. So it might not be that warm water or low oxygen or a migration 
or a disease could would be overly detrimental on their own, but be that these multiple features together are what is causing big problems in some populations of salmon. And, and like you mentioned, there are some things we can control. There are some things that we have much less control over. You know, a good example being climate change. Ultimately, humans are, are largely responsible for our ongoing climate woes, but we don't have a, an immediate way to control that within British Columbia or, or slightly more broadly year to year. So we, we have to take that as a given and, and really try to manage the system that salmon face by, by tweaking things that we do have control over. Aquaculture being one of those, um, pollution being another, you know, agricultural practices, et cetera, is an obvious one. And uh, so, so finding, finding the balance and, and what the, the best things to do in combination of, within those things that we can control for the best possible outcomes for salmon health and salmon more broadly is really the name of the game. And, and there are parallels with human health, of course, too, in, in that uh, the technology uh, that scientists like you now have at your disposal can really significantly expand the knowledge uh, of, of what is affecting health, uh, the various factors that are out there. I often describe this project that we have, the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, as, as being akin to the Human Genome Project. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, in a sense, we're using genomics, the ability to look very closely at genomic profiles within these fish to understand their health factors. Tell us more about technology and, and, and how genomics and genomic technology has advanced this type of work so, so rapidly. Sure, sure. I, I, I just want to say when we're touching on the topics of human health and, and salmon disease, I want to mention that none of the, the infectious agents that we looked at or, or continue to look at pose a risk to human health per se. So they, they affect salmon or maybe affecting salmon, but it's not like they're gonna jump from salmon if you go out and catch a fish on the weekend, you're not gonna get infected by these salmon bacteria, viruses, et cetera. So that said, yeah, we, we definitely draw heavily on some of the technology that's been developed, uh, as you mentioned, around the Human Genome Project and other ongoing work. And, and these, these techniques have become, uh, much more well developed over the last several years, decades. You know, when I I'm I should say I'm not a geneticist, and lots of our our the technology we use does rely on genetic ideas, genomic ideas. So me having done uh, an undergraduate in biology, so I had some idea about you know the Human Genome Project and what that what that meant. I went away and did several years of ecological research and then came back to work with the PSF and, and work with Christy Miller's lab at, at DFO. And I, I have to say, the technology that we now have at our disposal seems like magic. It, it's sort of wizardry of a scale that I certainly wasn't aware of. And, and some of this technology is pretty, pretty incredible. So I'll, I'll sketch out a few of the, a few of the pieces that that have become sort of our workhorses within the program, within the Salmon Health program. The really, the key one that was the core element of the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative was, was a program to use, or technology to use genetic testing to screen for multiple different infectious agents within individual salmon. And, and it's really the technology that came out of the Human Genome Project that allowed us to do that at scale. So whereas the, the sort of old approach, the traditional approach would be to take a fish, take a sample of, of, of tissue from that fish. And if you wanted to say, is this agent here? Well, you might have to go and get a Petri dish and swab the Petri dish and culture the agent, see if you could find it. There's a bunch of other technique, techniques you could use. If you wanted to use genetic techniques, you could you could run a genetic test for a single infectious agent. And if you wanted to test for multiple agents, you'd have to run test upon test upon test. Well, what, what the modern technology allows is what we would call high throughput approaches. So we can take a fish and we can screen it simultaneously for about 45 different infectious agents. 
And we can do that for about a hundred fish all at the same time, which is pretty. So we have what we call these chips and they, they go into a machine, they get loaded with uh, fish samples, they get loaded with chemical reagents that allow the tests to occur. And on each one of these chips, we can run 10,000 approximately tests at a single go. And then we can use that information to ask questions about, okay, these fish are infected with one infectious agent or, or another. Now, how do we relate that to ecological setting, things we know about the fish when they were collected, et cetera. And, the other thing, the other technology oh. that we, we've developed as part of the program is the ability to take uh, samples from those fish. So we, again, take fish tissue. And a traditional approach might be to take that tissue, slice it really thinly, put it on a microscope slide, and then look at it under a microscope. And you can do different things to, to illustrate different features of that tissue. So it might be a, you know, a slice of liver and you're looking to see if, if there's evidence of, of lesions, of signs of disease in that fish's liver. Well, with this new genetic technology, we can take that same sample and we can apply these kind of genetic tests basically. And we can actually, rather than just looking at whether there's you know, diseased tissue, uh, whether there are signs of infection with a virus or a bacteria or certain parasites, we can actually visually identify the genes mm -hmm. of the individual bacteria, parasites within the tissue. And we can see whether those, those genes of those infectious agents are co-localized in the same place as these potential lesions within the tissue. So it's a really powerful way to say, is there an infectious agent in this specific part of the fish? And is it tied to a sign of disease within that tissue? The, the, third, the third thing that, that the new genetic technology has allowed us to do is, is kind of go one step up. So we can say, are the disease, are the infectious agents present? Are they affecting the fish tissue? And then we can ask questions of kind of the whole organism, the whole fish more holistically and look at patterns of what we call gene expression. So genes are the set of instructions to our cells. And the same is true of a human or a salmon. And, and when we face one challenge or another in the course of our lives, uh, different sets of those genes may be turned on. You know, different switches are thrown within our cells that, that mean that the genes are, are turned on to different extents we would say upregulated or downregulated within cells. And we can use the same high throughput technology to ask which are the genes within an individual fish that are turned on. And the, the, the thing we've done the most with that within the, the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative is to look at viral infections. So we, there are genes that are turned on within fish that are very clear indicators that the fish is infected with a virus. And so we can, we can link up the, the infectious agent detection data with the, this gene activation information, and we can say it's infected with virus A, and it looks like it's, it's suffering from infection. The really interesting thing we've been able to do is say, okay, this, this fish is, appears to be suffering from a viral infection or viral disease we can't find any viruses in that fish. And then what we've been able to do then is dig down and use gene sequencing technology, again, leading on from the Human Genome Project. And we've actually sequenced the tissue in which we found the, the signal of that disease. And we've discovered brand new viruses that we didn't know about before using that approach. And so the, the SSHI and, and PSF have... Uh, so far found 15 new viruses in just a few years using that approach. So it's pretty, pretty exciting scientifically, potential big implications for, for salmon health and, and the health and salmon populations generally. Now you do a wonderful job of describing this, Andrew. Now, one question I was going to ask you when you talk about fish for, for people who may be somewhat new to this topic, um, Give us, tell us, what were the, uh, did you just look at Pacific salmon? Did you look at 
just wild. Tell us what were the range of, of salmon that were included in this genomic study? Well, there were a few, a few different salmon species that we, we focused on. And for anyone who, who likes fishing for salmon or eating salmon in BC, you'll probably be aware that, uh, there you go, me too. Uh, you'll probably be aware that, that Chinook salmon, coho salmon, sockeye salmon are some of the kind of key species. Yeah. And, and those are the focus on the Pacific salmon side. So from the wild salmon perspective, those were the, the three species that we, we mainly focused on and collected thousands and thousands of, of samples uh, from various existing programs within DFO and, and other scientists collecting, collecting salmon samples up and down the coast. Uh, we looked at juvenile, Chinook, coho, and sockeye. We also collected adult fish. Uh, so a really wide, wide range across those species. And then like you, she also looked directly at farm salmon. And within BC, the majority of farms are Atlantic salmon, come from the Atlantic Ocean, aren't native to BC. Uh, we developed some partnerships with the salmon farming industry and managed to get samples of, of fish from salmon farms, Atlantic salmon from salmon farms. We also looked a little bit, not quite as, as in detail, but at the Chinook salmon on salmon farms as well. So we had, we had information from, from lots of different sources. And, and that's really one of the things that, that led to the power of the program and continues to help inform the program as we move forward. And, and there have been some very uh, high profile uh, elements that have come out of this uh, study. I wonder if you could talk about, uh, you know, PRV, piscine rio orthovirus. Or, see, I never get it right when I try to do it. You'll get it correct. <laughs> but PRV, uh, which was a pretty significant finding that we had a couple of years ago and, and, and what we've found and, and what we're concerned about in that context. Salmon farming and, and the issue of salmon health is a, is a bit of a hot topic in BC right now, as many people will know. Uh, I think that boils down to the fact that people really care about salmon. Salmon are important for uh, livelihoods, they're important culturally, they're important for ecology and the ecosystems around us. So it, it's controversial in many cases because there's just so much at stake for people. And, and PRV is a really good example of of where the controversy seems to sort of boil times. And it wasn't, it wasn't an initial target of the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative to focus on PRV in particular, but it, it had one of the infectious aids, one of the viruses that, that we've, uh, we've really spent a lot of time just because of the results that we started seeing. Uh, PRV is piscine ortho-reovirus. Say that 10 times fast. And, and when, it, when it really came to the fore for the study was when uh, a colleague of mine, Emiliano De Chico, who also works uh, for PSF, uh, started seeing evidence of the disease that PRV causes in Atlantic salmon. It's called heart and skeletal muscle inflammation. Started seeing that on fish in salmon farms in BC. And that was the first time there'd been uh, identification of this disease. People you know, were pretty sure that the virus was here and we were detecting the virus within the program, but this was the first time that we'd seen evidence that it might be causing a problem. That itself was, has been quite a controversial uh, finding. The program then went on to find evidence for PRV causing disease in, in Chinook salmon as well, Chinook salmon on farms, which of course, raises the question, is it causing disease for wild Chinook salmon, not on farms? Because you know, as, as much as, as we may be interested in whether PRV is causing disease for Atlantic salmon, that's not really our main concern here in British Columbia when we're thinking about the health of wild salmon populations. So it's like I was talking about before, it may be that, that Atlantic salmon farms are serving as a sort of incubator for PRV. It's infecting fish on Atlantic farms. And then the, the real the re real risk we're concerned about is whether that PRV is transferring to wild salmon and and causing them issues. There have been lots of questions floating around 
over the years about, about PRV. Where did it come from? When did it arrive? Uh, does it transmit between farmed and wild salmon? Is it just naturally transmitting in wild salmon populations? And a recent study, what sort of our most, most recent study that's coming out in the next, next couple of weeks, led by Gideon Mordecai at UBC, uh, uses, again, some of these, these fancy new genetic techniques and actually some of the same, same techniques that have been used to study uh, the evolution and transmission of variants of the coronavirus uh, around the world. So using some of those same techniques has looked at PRV within salmon in BC and actually around the world. And what he's been able to show is that PRV came from the Atlantic Ocean. It's actually arrived in BC at current times. It's quite clear from the, from the evidence that it's arrived a couple different. Uh, it's also transferred from uh, the Atlantic Ocean down to Chile. There's been a, a transmission event from BC down to Chile. So we can really track where the virus is moving around the world. In the course of tracking its movements around the world, we're able to say that, that PRV arrived in BC sometime around when salmon farming started. So it's not direct evidence that it was brought initially with salmon farming, but it's a pretty good indication. And then we can further dig down and identify patterns of transmission between salmon farms and wild salmon. And we actually see for Chinook salmon at, at relevant times of year, Chinook salmon that we catch in the ocean and then sample back in the lab are more likely to have PRV infecting them if they were caught close to a salmon farm. Mm -hmm. And so that's another line of evidence that really there's something going on here. Salmon farms are transmitting PRV to our wild fish. Yeah. And, and another, the final piece that we see from that study is that over the last few decades, PRV numbers, PRV infections throughout the, the Eastern Pacific around us have really increased over time. So it's not as if there's just some background level of PRV floating around infecting the odd wild fish, farm fish. It's really shot up in recent years. So this is one of the examples of, of the kind of thing that's possible when we apply these new tools to look at a specific agent. And there are a number of different infectious agents that we're looking at and, and trying to paint a, a picture of, of what's going on and, and whether individual agents and the, the suite of agents may be affecting wild salmon. Yeah, and of course, one of the challenges that we have with this research, Andrew, is that, you know, fish are in that black box of the uh, marine environment, the Strait of Georgia, uh, out the ocean. They're underwater. So we don't really have the occasion to watch the, how these things affect the fish necessarily and monitor that or see when they die, how they die. Uh, maybe talk just a little bit about that because my sense is that that's kind of at the heart of the scientific uh, debate, because this is very contentious debate, you know, is, 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 you know, we at the Salmon Foundation, based on your good work, believe we have, uh, you know, enough evidence to think, let's err on the side of caution here, given how much our wild stocks are struggling. They go right by these farms. It's a tight, narrow corridor up there through the Johnstone Strait. Uh, so let's err on the side of caution and figure out a better way to do this, get these out of the water. But there are other points of view and, and, you know, credible scientists who have a different point of view. And uh, back to the sort of premise of my question there, it's, I guess it comes down to this question of, well, if we can't see that it actually causes something to happen, then we don't know that it's true. Can, can you just talk a bit about that sort of dichotomy that you're facing within the scientific uh, community? Yeah, there, it, it, is a, it is a pretty... Uh, complicated scenario, like we've said. And as you, as you mentioned, there are different points of view and there are different points of view about the science and also about what we should be prioritizing, uh, you know, as, as a province, as a country. And obviously from the Pacific Salmon Foundation's perspective, really wild salmon are, are at the core of what we do. So we're viewing things through a precautionary lens for wild salmon. So if there's uncertainty on a topic, we're going to say, err on the side of wild salmon. 
You know, there are clearly decisions we can make that uh, that will be better at protecting, more likely to protect wild salmon populations. Yeah. You mentioned the the difficulty in in observing fish in the ocean. Yeah, it's sometimes described as a black box, as you say. Yeah. Fish go in, they're there for a while, and then we hope they come back. We hope we're able to catch them in the ocean or or see them when they're responding to the river, uh, returning to the rivers to spawn. Hmm. And that's really one of the challenges of studying fish health in wild, wild salmon, wild fish in general. If fish are on a farm or, or in a hatchery even, uh, you know, we can we can observe them on a daily basis sometimes or, or, or even more. I mean, we can watch them hour to hour, minute to minute. And, and we can see if those fish might be developing infections, developing signs of disease, maybe not, not swimming quite right or something like that. Whereas with wild fish, we only, we only interact with a certain part. And, and so what, what we did within the, the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative and what the information we continue to use is is for multiple programs like i said that catch fish throughout that that life cycle all around bc and and try and tease apart what's going on and so for 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 fish on a salmon farm say uh you know disease might might be manageable if you if you get a bacterial infection uh as a salmon and and the the salmon farmers can treat that with antibiotics then it might not affect you too much Whereas for a wild salmon in that black of the ocean, you know, a, a salmon that even you know has has just a cold, uh, so to speak, might be a little bit worse at swimming. It might be a little bit less able to find food. It might be a little bit less able to avoid a predator. And so, what are manageable infections or diseases in the context of salmon aquaculture may pose much bigger challenges for wild salmon. So what, what we've done at that kind of broad scale perspective, the coast wide population level view of wild salmon is try to ask, okay, we, we see or we, or we may not see one or another of these infectious agents, but are the levels of those infectious agents that we see in those wild populations related to the patterns of survival and return of spawners that we know from, from other studies? and what we see is there's a mixed bag. So some infectious agents seem to be you know, absent for one thing. Infe infectious agents are not tied to poor salmon returns or poor salmon survival. But for other infectious agents, we do see a link and, and PRV is one of those. Um, there are some other agents. Uh, one that I work on is Tanasa baculum maritimum. So it's a bacterial infection, bacterial agent that exists worldwide actually and infects a whole number of fish species. But what we've been able to identify recently is it it looks like it has been infecting Fraser River sockeye as a result of salmon farming in the Discovery Islands. And we also see that it has some of these population level impacts or associations with population level effects for wild salmon up and down the coast. Now I have a rule, when you use a 10 cent term, I always ask you to break it down to a nickel term. When you say population level effects, sure. help the history major and those out there who may not understand what that is, what does that mean? <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I guess it's kind of a, a catch-all phrase yeah. and a, a, bit of a, a bit of a biologist phrase. Yeah. So when we think of, of salmon and we think of salmon health, of course, we can think of individual fish. So you can catch an individual fish in the ocean it may be infected, it may be obviously diseased or not. But what we're really concerned about from a, from a management and a conservation perspective is all of those individual fish together. And individual fish that come back to a specific river or river system to spawn, we usually think of those as a population. And one river may have a spawning population of Chinook, it may have a spawning population of pink salmon, coho salmon, etc. There's There's different species, different spawning areas and and these fish have differences that are that are important to people and to the ecology of the systems and when we're talking about population level impacts population level effects what we're really worried about is whether those populations those 
groups of spawning salmon within rivers or river systems are, are healthy and able, able to sustain themselves. So if we see a decline year over year over year in the number of spawning salmon in some, some reach of the Fraser River or the Skeena or some other river system, that's, that's cause for concern. And, and what we've been able to identify within the work at PSF is to say, in some cases, those declines year over year seem to be tied to infections with individual infectious agents. Okay, very helpful, Andrew. And of course, we know that, you know, take sockeye in the Fraser River, for example, uh, we've had the last two years, uh, you know, his, literally historic <clears throat> low, poor returns of those fish. And, uh, you know, going back, you were talking about the life cycle earlier, uh, you know, these fish are, salmon are so amazing and resilient. They have to go from the interior of BC through highly developed uh, lower mainland, through the Strait of Georgia, up by the farms where we are hearing about these uh, disease uh, issues. And that's just kind of the beginning. They have to <laughs> then go out to the open ocean uh, and depending on the species can sp you know, spend uh, a couple of years out there. And, and we're hearing more and more from researchers about the challenges that are going on in the North Pacific where the salmon are, are, are mixing together not enough food and warming, warming waters. Uh, so this, I just say all that to come back to that larger life cycle context that when we do have sockeye, chinook, coho, particularly the thing about the Fraser River that are, that are many of those stocks are in such difficult uh, shape, uh, this type of research to help find, pinpoint those things that we can take action on sooner rather than later to try to improve those, those returns. So I guess try to have a question out of this for you. Uh, we have seen some policy changes here that have been significant. The federal government has said we are going to transition pens out of the water by 2025. Um, the provincial government has said that by next year, about this time next year, that they will have new standards for issuing tenures uh, or, or rights to operate farms in our, in our coastal waters, which will be based on salmon health, uh, the, the precautionary approach essentially, um, the making sure they don't do harm to salmon, but and also the, uh, the rights of First Nations to exert their uh, uh, authority uh, and, and rights uh, on decisions. And this, of course, is another area of contention. Many First Nations want the pens out, uh, and then there are some nations who have relationships with the agriculture industry and, 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 and coastal communities that depend on the jobs. It's very complicated. Uh, we look after the wild salmon. That's our focus and the health, and we've taken our position because of the science. But my question to you is, long wind up here. I'm sorry, Andrew. You know, the question is from a policy perspective and informing the people that make decisions about fisheries and salmon and, and, and you know, whether it be in fisheries and oceans, Canada or, or First Nations or the British Columbia government, how do you see this type of research that you're doing improving uh, and informing those types of decisions? And, and are you optimistic that people are embracing this type of new technology? Well, again, it's a it's a complicated picture. Obviously, from PSF's perspective, as you say, we're focused on wild salmon, and and from the the fish health angle, we're really trying to do the best science that we can, provide the best evidence about how various stressors that affect fish health, salmon farms, but also, as I said, temperate oceans, uh, other impacts fish may face, how those are affecting. The, the fish that, that we love and rely on. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's not up to us to make those decisions about policy and directions economically and, and all these different things that as, as a, a nation Canada or as individual First Nations, we may meet, need to make decisions about. So we can provide the best evidence we can. And that evidence really forms, hopefully forms uh, one part of the decision-making process that that others in in governments really at the end of the day have to make, 
moving forward, we're we're optimistic that that what we've been finding and what we continue to find within the Salmon Health Program at PSF and with our collaborators, Christy Miller, especially at DFO, but lots of others up and down the coast. We really hope that that what we find can be used in a, in a policy context is relevant. We think it's relevant. There's some really exciting new tools that that we've been developing over the years. Again, this is in collaboration with with Christy Miller's lab at DFO. Really, she she's the the geneticist genomicist engine that that drives lots of this. And so, like I mentioned about the technology that allows us to uh, detect you know a viral disease in in a, a state of viral disease in an individual salmon. Well, we can also use that same technology. To, to look at which genetic switches are being switched on in a fish when that fish is too warm or doesn't have enough oxygen or is about to die even. And so we can use this new toolkit, which we call the fit chip technology. Uh, and we can use this, this toolkit at our disposal to start asking more questions about these multiple sources of stress that salmon face throughout the course of their lives. And, and it allows us to come back to that question of cumulative effects. What is affecting fish? And are the different stressors that fish face in combination having an outsized impact? And, and then we can ask, well, we know there's all these different stressors out here. We can assess the pattern of stress up and down the coast or throughout the life cycle of salmon. And we can then ask, okay, what are the stressors that we could best remove or mediate for these fish? What could we do to give them the best chance of exerting that resilience that you mentioned that we know is inherent to salmon? And if we can help inform policy through science by providing answers to those questions, we really feel that we've done our job. And that that's the focus of, of where we're gonna go over the next, and hopefully can be seen as the focus of what we've done over several years with, with all of this work. Yeah. And kudos to your team too. You, you mentioned in working with individual uh, indigenous and first nations. Uh, we are, and we're invited by the first nations in the Broughton uh, archipelago agreement to assist them with, with the scientific uh, monitoring and, and technology side. And, and we have really, I think it's, to your credit and our, our Christy Miller's credit, Dr. Brian Riddle, our, our team uh, with Genome BCDFO, I think that's that we've we've advanced this knowledge quite a bit, uh, and I'm I'm very keen to see where it goes uh, in in the future, and particularly in the context of climate change. When you talk about the fit chip that you just shared, the kind of the future of the program, you know, to be able to look at a variety of other stressors that we think are there, but we may not know much about. Andrew, before we close up here, I really appreciate your time. Anything that I didn't ask that you'd like to share with, with folks that are watching Salmon Matter? Any other topics you want to talk about? I guess just touching what you what you said there, that's actually a, a good point, something that's really, really exciting and it's kind of an affirmation of the work we've been doing is that you know, whether it's whether it's First Nations or or other groups that we work with, or even that we haven't partnered with in the past. There's much interest in adopting the technologies that have been developed in part by PSF in partnership with those other other researchers and and using them more more broadly uh, and not just for salmon, but but for other species as well. But but we're obviously focused on salmon. And, and so taking that technology and applying it in different areas of the province and even around the world, there's groups in, in Norway, for example, that are adopting the technology that we've helped develop. And, and so it's really exciting to see that. We, we think that really indicates that we're, we're onto something here and, and hopefully it can be useful uh, from the perspective of wild salmon. Well, thanks, Andrew. You are doing remarkable work and you've spent the better part of an hour here really helping the people understand the, the complexity, but doing it in a very uh, easy to understand and, and uh, uh, succinct way. So thanks for all your work. I'm thrilled you're part of our team uh, at, at PSF and look forward to what you're going to come up with uh, in, the, in the years to come. So thanks, Dr. Andrew Bateman, who is the uh, Salmon Health Manager at the Pacific Salmon Foundation for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Andrew. 
Well, and that will wrap up this edition of Salmon Matter on Salmon Health. We will uh, have more to say about this because this is a topic that we at Pacific Salmon Foundation are going to continue to invest in with our partners uh, like Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Genome BC. have to add that you know, our model is a partnership model and we have many donors who contributed funds to this research and continue to fund this research. Too many to name at once, but we thank you, all the donors and certainly partners at Fisheries and Oceans Canada and, and, and uh, Genome BC and the many First Nations now that we're working with on this, this research as well. So much more to come. Thank you very much for joining this edition of Salmon Matter, a co-production of the Pacific Salmon Foundation and Conversations That Matter. Keep well. Thank you.